Hello, my name is Fred Heinzel, and I'm going to be talking about uh, leishmaniasis today. This is one of several lectures I give on it, and this is going to be a little more middle of the road compared to some of my others that uh, cover issues of immunology. So the, the teaching goals this time around is to understand a little more about uh, the epidemiology and significance of clinical leishmaniasis throughout the world. The most important thing here is to recognize that this is really a very complex disease with multiple and distinct disease syndromes. Uh, you need to know a bit more about diagnosis and treatment because of these different syndromes. Uh, to recognize that uh, it, Leishmania infectious is in fact an opportunistic infection of uh, AIDS. And a little discussion of the relevance of this disease to travelers, military, and residents of the United States. Okay, so Leishmania is a, a unicellular protozoan parasite of the genus Canetoplastida. Uh, it ex is transmitted by biting sand flies to mammalian hosts. Uh, the parasite itself exists in two forms. Uh, what you see on top here is the flagellar free swimming form or the promastigote form. Now this is the form that normally grows inside the, the intestine of the sand fly. And eventually, with uh, the sandfly takes a blood meal, uh, the parasite gets injected under the skin. Depending on the species of the parasite, and depending on the host immune response, you can get a spectrum of diseases. <clears throat> uh, you can have very simple uh, um, cutaneous ulceration. Uh, in some cases, a later complication of cutaneous ulceration can include a, a disfiguring uh, disease called mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. And for certain species of leishmania, rather than cutaneous or oral cutaneous infection, you indeed have visceral infection with spleen and liver being massively involved. And this is the potentially fatal form of leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is a worldwide concern. Uh, it, it is significant in terms of the number of people uh, infected in a given year. WHO uh, thinks it's somewhere around 12 million people infected per year. But more importantly, because it involves all continents of, of the world except for the Antarctica and Australia, some 350 million people live in endemic areas are, and are at risk of disease. Uh, this map gives you an idea that areas of visceral disease tend to be a little more concentrated throughout the world. Uh, but it exists in both the Old and New World, and cutaneous uh, uh, leishmaniasis is really very prevalent throughout uh, uh, both uh, uh, throughout much of the globe. And more importantly, given the number of people involved, the number of people at risk, and the fact that they're going to continue to be, infect, be infections over time, it, it is remarkable there is no effective vaccine available. This is especially remarkable in the fact that for most species of Leishmania, when you naturally cure your infection, you're resistant to that species for the rest of your life. So uh, effective uh, protective immunity, sterilizing immunity does exist. Uh, it's just we can't seem to reformulate it for use. Just a little bit of history. Uh, the, the, the term Leishmaniasis really comes from the name of Sir William Leishman. These were all um, uh, Scottish uh, soldiers who were deployed, I, I believe, in the Middle East back around uh, the turn of the century before World War I. And so Sir William Leishman and Charles Donovan, both uh, in different places, uh, uh, developed uh, special dyes that allowed them to actually see these parasites inside uh, the tissues. Um, and uh, because at that time they were in an area where there was visceral disease, uh, it was named uh, Leishmania and Donovani, and that's where that, that term comes from. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned this is in the order Canetoplastida. Trypanosomes are also in the same order, and then there's a variety of other protozoan that uh, belong to this uh, uh, genus, but uh, aren't necessarily uh, parasites of human. Uh, some of the trypanosome-like organisms inside termites are also in this family. Why do we call it a canetoplastida? The canetoplast really is an overgrown mitochondria that tends to localize near where uh, the flagellar uh, uh, body uh, enters in, into the cell, and uh, or the, which is uh, called, uh, because it, it moves the um, uh, protozoan around. It's, it's, it's called the canetoplastida. Um, this, this remains even in when the flagella is shed uh, as it transitions to a different uh, um, life stage. Okay, again, a dimorphic parasite uh, in, in liquid phase, which is either in the gut of the sandfly or you can grow in a tissue culture if you want. Uh, you can see these flagellar forms, and you got a, here's your nucleus, and then your canetoplast, which is always a bar shaped organelle right here. This is uh, critical in terms of recognizing this organism inside cells or in a smear, some wounds. 
Um, there's also an amascote form, and this is the inter obligate intracellular form of uh, the parasite. It actually uh, induces phagocytosis into a macrophage, typically, although other cells will also take up leishmania. And once it enters into the cell, it goes into a phagolysosome, it loses its flagella, it changes its metabolic uh, um, uh, requirements, and survives within the hostile environment of the phagolysosome. <clears throat> This is what happens in the mammalian host. The sandfly comes along, takes a bite from the skin that has some infected macrophages in it, picks them up, they convert to promastigotes inside the gut again, and the cycle goes on. Which, um, that's very interesting. But, um, I don't know why it's doing this, but uh, you see the cycle right here. Promastigote injected, infects the macrophages, replicates, picked up by the sandfly and grown in the gut, or in uh, uh, culture media if you want, which is important in terms of diagnosis. <clears throat> so it is odd that it, it chooses to live inside a macrophage, particularly the phagolysosome of the macrophage, uh, which is considered an extremely hostile environment to 99.9% .9 of the uh, par uh, pathogens of the world. Um, it, it's obligatory for survival in mammals. Uh, part of this reason is, is that the, the mastigotes and promastigotes are fairly susceptible to complement lysis in the presence of antibodies, and so it, they, they work very hard to get themselves into a macrophage as quickly as they can. They actually interact with uh, receptors on the surface, and they've adapted uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the Leishmania antigens on the surface, adapted to interact with complement receptors and other receptors to uh, facilitate very rapid phagocytosis. From there, they're transported into the phagolysosome and, as I mentioned, convert to masco. And these, these mascots are specifically resistant to acid, pH, and hydrolytic enzymes. And here's, here's a culture of macrophages all with uh, uh, a mastigotes scattered throughout their cytoplasm. Uh, it's a little hard to tell here, but you see a little bar body, you see a little nucleus. So that's characteristic of this parasite when you're looking at tissue. Uh, just a, a few comments about evasion of phagolysosomal killing. That, that's a, it's a major topic in the interaction between host and uh, parasite. And several different parasites and bacteria have evolved their own techniques to get around this. I'm just introducing this because it, it's something to think about. This is all very important in the virulence of some critical organisms. Toxoplasma, for instance, the way it gets around this, it, it, it does not survive in the phagolysosome. It's killed very quickly. And yet, it, it, it basically takes itself up into macrophages or fibroblasts or other cells through a non-phagocytic mechanism, and it actually exits into the cytoplasm. It generates a vacuole around it that is actually a parasite origin and not of host origin. So essentially, then lives free within the cytoplasm, which probably benefits it in terms of nutrients and ATP and other factors that it can kind of feast on. Mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, is rapidly ingested by macrophages. Uh, it is susceptible to the phagolysosome, particularly in an interfering gamma-activated macrophage, but what it does is it prevents phagolysosomal fusion. It essentially uh, generates pores in the, uh, uh, the, the, the phagosome that allows uh, um, important molecules to, to exit that are necessary for this fusion function, and so it basically lives in an immature phagosome, and, which is not nearly so hostile. Trypanosome and cruzii and listeria have a similar technique of uh, their phagocytose, but they both have um, uh, they both have uh, fossil lipases uh, in uh, Lister, it's Lister lysin O, and this allows them to exit into the cytoplasm. They digest a hole in the phagolysosome to go straight into the cytoplasm. For the Listeria, this is really a godsend because they actually then jet around inside the cytoplasm. They form microtubules behind them, and they can actually project right out of the uh, plasma membrane into an adjacent cell without ever really having to go into the extracellular space. And Leishmania is probably the, the sole representative of the just tough it out uh, a class of uh, living within the uh, phagolysosome. <clears throat> Leishmania do other things to, to uh, protect their, um, their, their niche within the body. And one of these is they have a surface molecule. They have a lot of surface molecules, but they have one in particular, uh, which is a lipophosyl glycan. Uh, it's a membrane-associated complex glycolipid. Um, I won't go through this uh, glycosophosphatidylinositol anchor, which 
by the way, we use a lot in our own uh, um, cellular machinery. But the terminal sugars here do have um, uh, two functions. One is to determine vectorial competence. They they allow the promastigo to bind to the intestine wall of, of the sandfly, and uh, th that determines as to what species of sandfly they, they, they do best in. And then as they mature, the terminal sugars are rearranged, and they fall off the intestine, and they can progress forward into the mouth parts uh, for entry into the mammalian host. The other thing is that this actually is an immunosuppressive molecule. The core structure inhibits a, a variety of important pro protein kinases. These are all involved in, in, in very essential um, and, and shared uh, signaling mechanisms within cells, uh, both pr pr uh, protein kinase C, but also the MAP kinase uh, function. And this is important for activating host uh, immune responses within the macrophage, like production of nitric oxide and other things. So they actually uh, uh, impair the immune response of the cell they're living in. Uh, consistent with that fact, uh, lipophosphoglycan uh, deficient leishmania turn out to be avirulent. They 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 will um, infect cells, but uh, they um, uh, don't survive there. And this is a potential vaccine candidate that's being tossed around. The problem is it's a point mutation in all of these defects, and there's concern it will mutate back to virulence. <clears throat> so how do we get rid of Leishmania? It lives within side cells. It's protected from antibodies. Antibodies don't go inside cells in general. It's protected from complements. It's protected from polymorphic nuclear cells. So how are you going to kill it? Well, the macrophages uh, have specific pathways for dealing with intracellular parasitism. And this is very dependent on the existence of an innate immune response. Uh, in the case of Leishmania, uh, when we're infected and we become resistant, it's, it's uh, dependent on the development of CD4 T cells that uh, recognize antigens from uh, Leishmania, um, and they, they um, under the, the influence of interleukin-12 produced by other cells, they evolve into interferon gamma-producing cells, or so-called Th1 cells, and uh, then they're able to generate interferon gamma. Interferon gamma working on macrophages uh, will result in the induction of uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase. Uh, which is capable of producing very large amounts of nitric oxide. There's two other nitric oxide synthases, but they don't, they're, they're pretty much uh, uh, limited to um, uh, neuronal and endothelial compartments. And nitric oxide, which is a diffusible gas, is highly toxic uh, to, uh, um, uh, any, uh, to bacteria and parasites, diffuses into uh, the macrophage phagolysosome and kills the parasite. And that's absolutely essential. Any defect within this, this entire pathway will seriously impair resistance to Leishmaniasis, and by the way, it also impairs resistance to mycobacteria and just about any other intracellular pathogen you want to name, toxoplasma, listeria, chlamydia, you name it. <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, uh, as uh, um, Dr. Green has mentioned uh, in some of his talks, there are uh, naturally occurring gene defects uh, for these in human populations, and you can identify kindreds with usually susceptibility to mycobacteria. Just a few words about sand flies. Uh, they bite, they suck blood, and they transmit disease. In the old world, new world, they're different. Um, they belong to a different genus. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, the ecology of any arthropod-borne disease is very complex because now you have multiple partners in this very complex equation, and Leishmania is no different because each species or sometimes subspecies of sandfly may have very distinct habits and behaviors. They may or may not want to bite humans. They may bite something else. And, um, and uh, this uh, makes for highly variable and usually changing ecology over time. Uh, this is part of the reason that Leishmaniasis tends to be a disease described as uh, um, uh, emerging and re-emerging because it, it's forever um, uh, uh, um, appearing where you didn't expect to find it and disappearing from some other site. Okay, so the multiple species, each causing distinct disease syndromes. Uh, this gets a little complex. It's divided best into old world and new world uh, because uh, you know there's a 65 million a year gap between the two here and they've evolved in different ways. But the important thing is most of these species cause cutaneous leishmaniasis. In some cases, they cause cutaneous leishmaniasis with complications of either disseminated disease or mucocutaneous disease. So let's just kind of stick to those that cause cutaneous disease. And then you have this whole leishmania Donovani complex. Uh, and uh, this is what causes visceral disease, which in some respects is the, the, the more uh, feared disease. Okay, so 
Just going through the container slice from ISS in Old World, it had a lot of names, Oriental Sword, Dele Boil, Baghdad Boil, still highly endemic in Iraq and particularly in Afghanistan. Um, usually Leishmania major or Tropica. This is a, a zoonosis. The, uh, the, the reservoir in the wild is almost always a, a rodent. Sometimes it's a canine reservoir. Sand flies will feed on these, and that's where the majority of uh, the, the Leishmania exists. Uh, but then uh, the sand flies will bite humans, and they transmit the disease. Um, and some areas have very high endemic exposures, uh, and uh, you, you can pretty much guarantee anyone who lives there for a length of time will be infected. But it's of note that the number of clinically obvious infections to subclinical runs around 1 to 10, sometimes 1 to 8. So in endemic areas, you have a lot of people say that they were never infected and ascribe it to this or that. But if you do a skin test, you'll find that the majority of the people there are skin test positive. And that's simply because they've had subclinical infection. So this changes the epidemiology of, um, of the disease. In a particular country, it's generally felt to be, for people who don't move around a lot, it's the kids that have leishmaniasis. Why? Because they're the ones that are immunologically naive. They get infected. Some 10% of them will develop an ulcer. They heal, and then they're resistant for the rest of their life. Most of the other people have had subclinical disease, they have immunity, and so they don't develop disease. When you start seeing disease in adults, that's almost always because the adults are intruders, they're immunologically naive, they've entered into this endemic area, and now they can get disease, or they've acquired AIDS if they've lived there all their life. And that's a very important point. In some parts of the world, you see a lot of uh, uh, particularly visceral disease in older uh, people. Uh, you have to kind of wonder about whether or not they, they've got AIDS. Okay, you're... <laughs> This program is doing interesting things to my slides. Um, sort of a peekaboo style here. Okay, so what are these also? So, for cutaneous disease, what does it look like? It usually starts out as a little papule, then it becomes a nodule, begins to ulcerate, or it may just involute. This all occurs over a fairly long period of time. Lysh the, the, the cutaneous leishmaniasis is a very slow progressing disease. Uh, you're waiting two to five weeks after uh, the initial exposure before anything develops. Sometimes it can be up to months. Highly variable. Once you develop the disease, we're talking anywhere from three to maybe uh, 12 months of disease before it resolves, though it will almost always resolve. Uh, so people don't come to you and say, this developed yesterday, and, uh, you know, what do I do? It's almost always somebody's had it developing for a while, and they finally figure maybe they should do something. These tend to be uh, painless uh, lesions, unless they get super infected. Um, when they do heal, they usually heal with a scar, and then there is lifelong immunity. Occasionally, you can get a little local uh, adenopathy with this, at least for the, the usual cutaneous disease. A picture of a patient with a uh, large uh, ulcer on, on the forehead. Uh, this is obviously a problem in some cultures because if um, uh, the, the children, if, if, if the, the social structure depends on marrying your children off, and that's true most, for most cultures, uh, then a big scar in the forehead is not a good deal. And it's interesting in that, particularly among the Bedouin tribes, they uh, had uh, discovered uh, uh, several hundred years ago that one way you could get around this, if you, you got a little piece of somebody's ulcer and then poked it in your kid's behind, they would get an ulcer there, it would heal and they'd be resistant, and you wouldn't have to worry about them developing uh, um, uh, a disease in places where the sun does shine. So. Um, that, that's probably one of the earlier examples of uh, live uh, parasitic uh, vaccine development. And indeed, the uh, Israeli army used a very similar technique. They cultured uh, parasites and uh, inoculated their soldiers with this back well over 40 or 50 years ago just to prevent them from getting disease when they were working in the field, working uh, in, uh, of combat, that is. Uh, no one's doing that now, though. <clears throat> Another example of just a bad, uh, you know, cutaneous uh, ulcer. Uh, with uh, some plaques and, and uh, nodules uh, showing that it's, it's not always a single uh, ulcer. You can develop multiple no uh, ulcers. You may have ulcers in different stages. Here's a scar. Here's an ulcer. And here's some little satellite lesions popping up. This is not unusual for old world leishmaniasis or new world leishmaniasis for that matter. Um, a little more advanced cutaneous ulceration. These can really quite get quite deep and look very ugly. Uh, and sometimes they can actually expose underlying tendons or a joint, which is an indication for treatment, by the way. That's not a very good outcome. Um, again, uh, unless it's super infected, usually not terribly painful. Uh, but it does look terrible, and that will last for quite a while until it heals, and that person will have a scar. Another example of a child with a scar. <clears throat> okay, so Leishmaniasis, from the history and the appearance, you can 
pretty much have uh, you can pretty much um, estimate with high probability that's going to be leishmaniasis. Um, but it, it's important to actually make a diagnosis of leishmaniasis. One, because the treatment for it is potentially toxic. Uh, they're not great options still. <clears throat> so you want to be sure of what you have. And the best way to really go about making a diagnosis is you can either aspirate uh, if uh, uh, some of the tissue around the wound or a biopsy is probably preferable. But you can also do a smear in one of those ulcers. And then you stain with uh, right Gimsa. And what you'll see are macrophages here. Here's a classic mac. This is actually... Um, this is probably a more, yeah, this, this could be uh, from an ulcer, but so here's a macrophage and it's just stuff full of mastogotes and you can make out the little uh, bar-shaped body here in the nucleus. So that, that's a classic option. Uh, and if you were to do a biopsy of liver, for instance, in someone with visceral disease, uh, here you have the patocytes and here you have infected um, uh, Kupfer cells here. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, those are probably more immature. So this probably would have been a bone marrow biopsy. Okay. Which would also be a visceral disease as well. Uh, you, you can occasionally grow promastogotes out of uh, bone marrow in cutaneous disease, but you can't see them on smear. They're a very small number. Okay, so with the culture, what you're looking for are uh, d formation of these free-swimming promastogotes in liquid media. Um, this is something I can do, but it's very easy to call the CDC Division of Parasitology, and they can send you out a, a tube of, of growth media. All you have to do is make sure you get a good clean biopsy or an aspiration, uh, inoculate the media, and usually within a week or two, you'll have some parasites growing. And if you just look at them underneath an inverted scope, you can actually do this within the tube itself. You'll see these things swimming around here, and they, they tend to cluster up a little bit when they're growing in a promastogote stage. Why is this important? Uh, it, it, it gives you, allows you to diagnose that there's leishmaniasis, but more importantly, it allows you to, to do speciation, at least at the CDC, by looking at isoenzyme patterns. And I'll point out in this next section why that's important. So in the new world, cutaneous leishmaniasis is a little more complex because there are complications of the disease. Uh, similar presentation, you get single, multiple ulcers, you get satellite lesions, sometimes loco adenopathy. Very complex taxonomy. Uh, the, um, they, they change it all the time, and I don't think everyone's totally up on the current changes. Um, but there are groups. There's a Mexicana complex and a Brasiliensis complex, sometimes called a Viana complex. And these tend uh, to cause local cutaneous uh, lesions. Um, and, uh, but they also, in some cases, can cause this diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is very rare. <clears throat> Again, new world disease, uh, he, that's a scar, and this is an active lesion here. So it looks just like old world disease. Uh, one variant that seems to be more common in the new world is um, uh, um, basically chicolero ear. And th this seems to be a function of uh, workers collecting the uh, the gum material from chicle trees, mostly in Belize. Uh, and in, in that situation, the sandflies seem to hover at about six feet high, and that's their, their preferred location. Uh, the workers tend to go in with a lot of clothes on, even though it's tropical heat, uh, because of snakes and thorns. And so what's exposed is the ear, and that's about where the, the sandflies like to bite, at least so is it, it's thought. And once uh, the ulcer develops here, it's unfortunate because it tends to destroy the underlying cartilage and there's a long-term deformity. In some cases, these ulcers are very long-lived, um, uh, with reports of them lasting for years at a time, not really progressing very much, but uh, just causing deformity of the ear. And it's not just in humans. Uh, here's some more examples of chicolero ear, uh, including in kids who presumably weren't harvesting gum, I don't know. But dogs and, and rodents can also form cutaneous lesions on their ears. Yeah, well, I mean, it's probably siesta. I, I, could, I could understand that. Sure, uh, but, you know, I, when I take my siestas here, I always cover my ears, just that slow hint. <laughs> yeah, well, this isn't going to work because it never comes down to my ears. <laughs> all right. I'm sure the listeners will ignore all of those comments.
Okay, so, um, and then one of the other, comp, comp, okay, so this was the complication of uh, the Mexicana complex is uh, the, the, the diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, and as you may know from my lectures on uh, lepromonas leprosy, this is a, a look-alike disease. Uh, massive parasite load in an energic host. For whatever reason, it, it, uh, these individuals don't seem to generate interferon gamma at all. You can look at their T cells, they just don't make interferon gamma. As a result, they essentially are a permissive host for uh, dramatic uh, increase in numbers of, of Leishmania. Um, there's also an old world version I'm not going to go into very much other than the fact that it's uh, called L. Ethiopica and has a rock hyrax reservoir. We'll come back to that later. All right, and this is the, what the, uh, the old world version looks like. You have multiple papules, you have some nodules uh, here, uh, even potentially some, uh, um, you know, some swelling of the nose here from all the disease. Uh, <clears throat> patient, I actually, I, I took a picture of when I was there back many years ago with multiple nodules over his skin. His whole family had this, and uh, it, they'd had it for upwards of 10 to 15 years. And didn't think much of it, though the, some of the villagers further down the hill thought they were weird because they had these. Uh, and this is uh, in the New World uh, Diffuse Cutaneous Leishmaniasis. It looks just like Lepromatous Leprosy. Um, and uh, to sort, you know, to, to to determine whether it's lepromatous leprosy or leishmaniasis, I mean, obviously, one does a skin biopsy. If it's leprosy, you're going to have uh, acid fast bacilli in large numbers. If it's uh, leishmaniasis, you're going to see infected macrophages in very large numbers uh, that are stained by right gheme sustain. So it's not a very difficult differentiation. Okay, and then the other group, the New World Leishmania, that can cause simple cutaneous, uh, cutaneous ulcers or that can actually cause something more severe is the Brasiliensis complex or the Viania complex. And so the complication here is that in 2.3% of untreated cases, particularly for the L. Brasiliensis species, um, these individuals will develop mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis, usually on an average of between two and three years after they, they cure their cutaneous disease. So they're not out of the woods. Uh, this is a, a late uh, um, uh, problem of that particular disease. These patients um, do have, okay, just point out that um, you get simple cutaneous ulcerations, you can also get the sporotrichoid response, and this is very typical of the L. brasiliensis uh, marching on up the arm. Hopefully that's leishmaniasis. <clears throat> and then the, 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 the major complication here is the mucocutaneous disease, and uh, this is caused by a relatively small number of parasites living inside uh, the respiratory passages where um, the temperatures are lower, and just like if leprosy, leishmania Cutaneous leishmania likes to live in temperatures below 27 degrees. So you have a few parasites in here and you have this exaggerated immune response. Remember, they cured their cutaneous ulceration. They have an effective uh, cell-mated immune response. But there's something about the persistence of these parasites that essentially causes the host immune response to, uh, to attack the whole uh, pharyngeal and nasal area. And this results in uh, significant deformity. Uh, the cause of death in these patients often is aspiration uh, pneumonitis uh, because uh, the entire pharynx uh, is, becomes dysfunctional. Um, the Mexicana and Brasiliensis uh, species uh, tend to coexist. And here's yellow for uh, we're missing it there. I guess that's Brasiliensis. And then a Mexicana complex. So you can't depend on where to get the disease and determining which is which. And this brings me back to the whole issue of um, of uh, making sure that you do cultures to speciate because the CDC will be able to tell you this was Mexicana or this was a Brasiliensis complex. If it's a Brasiliensis complex, you must treat the cutaneous disease to avoid the complications of the mucocutaneous disease. And we'll, we'll talk about treatment in a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, visceral leishmaniasis. And uh, here you have dramatically enlarged uh, liver and uh, enlarged spleen. <coughs> in a young boy who, as I mentioned, is probably susceptible because he hasn't had disease before. Uh, <clears throat> called Calazar because I, I think in, in um, 
um, Sanskrit, uh, that means dark disease, because the skin would turn dark, mostly from uh, the inflammatory pigmentation. It has also about a two to four month incubation. It presents as a more systemic disease. You don't necessarily get ulcers with this. Instead, what you'll get is uh, a, a wasting disease, become cachexic, enormous hepatosplenomegaly, eventually pancytopenia and hypergammon globulinemia. And as they waste and become sicker, uh, the chance of a fatal um, uh, uh, pneumonia uh, from just a uh, pneumococcus uh, becomes um, uh, a probability and often common uh, cause of death here is a super, uh, um, superimposed infection. Um, asymptomatic and subclinical forms occur in Brazil in particular. Uh, they've, um, children, um, school children are often uh, on routine exam to palpate the spleen. If the spleen is large, they have some serologies they can do to indicate whether or not they have subclinical visceral ischemoniasis. A lot of those will, will recover, a small percent will begin to progress, and they can treat them um, early. Uh, otherwise, visceral ischemoniasis, when it's full-blown, is 85% uh, fatal unless it's treated. Just pointing out that uh, there is visceral disease in the old world and in the new world. Now, unlike <clears throat> uh, cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, um, there's, a, there's a very close genetic relatedness here. I think this is going to yeah. So uh, visceral disease in the new world is actually an imported disease within the last few hundred years from uh, southern Europe. And in southern Europe, uh, this Donabani organism is, it, 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 this particular one's uh, called infantum in part because it mostly disease occurs in infants. Uh, it was transported into Brazil where eventually it was called Chagazi, but genetically it's almost identical to what's here. Um, Donovani species proper is, is a little more common to sub-Saharan Africa and a more eastern word in uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, but this is an example of how Leishmania can establish itself in a, a new geographic location. And in this particular case, this is very disturbing because these are phlebotomous sandflies. These are Lutzemia sandflies. They've been separated for 65 million years. And the, the, the two different groups of sandfly, look, they're, they're very distinct. They look differently. They have different enzymes. And yet somehow this, this parasite made to jump into that vector here. And what's of concern is that the vector down here, Dilutzimai, are very similar to the ones we have in the southern United States. And it's been known from laboratory studies that uh, these, these sandflies are capable of transmitting uh, several different species of Leishmania. So um, this is uh, yet another example of the fact this is an emerging and re-emerging disease of considerable importance in the world. <clears throat> as common as mosquitoes, <clears throat> um, well, have you identified? Oh, well, yeah. As sandflies are a little harder to recognize. They're really quite small, <clears throat> and they don't fly very. They're terrible flyers, so they tend to cluster around burrows or holes in the ground, and they they don't go terribly far. Uh, the entomologists looking for them know where to go. Uh, I don't know how prevalent they are in this immediate area. Um, just looking at the maps of where they exist, we're within that area. But uh, they, they tend to exist in kind of focused concentrations depending on what, what uh, sort of... Um, they bite, and they bite in a way that's very obvious. <clears throat> and they're not very big. They're bigger than OCMs. And I think like some of the typical lanai screens that I have around here would probably keep them out. They're a little bigger than a head of, they're sort of a, like a big head of a pen. All right. Uh, okay, transmission of visceral disease in the old world uh, tends to be, um, uh, well, in the new world, and in most places, tends to either be zoonotic or anthropogenic. So this is an exception uh, compared to uh, cutaneous disease. Uh, in India and Kenya, in particular, the, the definitive reservoir for disease are actually humans. Uh, whereas in these other countries, uh, you try and stay away from infected areas with rodents and, and canines. Here, the problem is, is that your neighbor may, in fact, have a large parasite load, and the, the, the sandfly is transmitting disease from him to you. So in, in these countries, what they've gone to is uh, to, they, they've had more, um, they've had some success in trying to eradicate areas of disease and that's been mostly through mass chemotherapy of, of patient populations. Uh, in India in particular that, that's worked reasonably well that they still tend to have big outbreaks up in the uh, I think it's the Bihar 
uh, to very northern uh, provinces where the medical care in the past has not been as good. That's improving dramatically these days. And Kenya, uh, there, there are some areas get uh, mass treatment, others don't. And it's interesting, those that don't get very aggressive mass chemotherapy tend to have persistent outbreaks. And where other places like the Beringo District of Kenya, where because of political connections, they had lots of health care made available for treatment. Um, they haven't had much disease at all in the last 10, 15 years. <clears throat> okay, and again, just pointing out, here's a group of kids in Brazil now who all are uh, skin test positive for uh, Leishmania, and um, and yet none of them have visceral disease. Just pointing out that the majority of Leishmaniasis is, is actually a subclinical or asymptomatic infection. And it's of some interest why there is a spectrum of uh, that, that's particularly pronounced in visceral disease of those patients who have progressive disease that are potentially fatal and those that have a that are asymptomatic or spontaneously cured disease and don't know it unless you actually do a skin test. And there, some of this can be explained by the type of immune response that's generated. Again, it's mostly the uh, cell-mediated immune response. In the case of visceral disease, people with progressive visceral disease don't have a delayed type hypersensitivity, which is very dependent on cell-mediated immunity. It's a good marker for that. Self-limited disease, people who have cured it, are very strongly DTH positive. Uh, in visceral disease, very little production of interferon gamma, which I told you is important for killing intracellular parasites. And they have a strong response of interleukin-10. Interleukin-10 is sort of a downer cytokine. It tends to inhibit immune responses of certain types, in particular of uh, pro-inflammatory uh, T-cell responses. Um, and then you have the, the, uh, the mere opposite on the self-limited uh, disease with a strong interferon gamma response and a relatively weaker interleukin-10 response. Um, but fortunately for people with visceral disease, if you treat them with appropriate drugs, uh, you invoke a de delayed type hypersensitivity response and they develop long-lasting immunity. So there's something about the number of parasites that directly impairs the response and recovery of effective cell-mediated immunity. And this may or may not be related to the lipophosphoglycan that it has, which is sort of a uh, type of immune suppressant that drags along with them. <clears throat> Okay, so recovery from Leishmaniasis usually confers lifelong immunity, but along with that, uh, you don't kill all the parasites, and Leishmania do remain latent in tissues, and so any subsequent immune suppression later in life will cause reactivation of disease, and this is very well demonstrated in transplantation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, big transplant centers around the world uh, um, are, are, um, have seen uh, patients that have cutaneous disease or visceral disease uh, while they're uh, being treated. I don't think this ever happened at Moffitt, has it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it, those reports are generally more out of the Middle East you know, from transplant centers there and from Europe. So it may have more to do with uh, uh, you know, visceral disease rather than cutaneous disease. Okay, and then the other thing we we'll do this is uh, obviously HIV with significant CD4 cytopenia, specifically when you you reach uh, you know, the diagnostic group of AIDS. All right, and then uh, the diagnosis here is relatively straightforward, except instead of biopsying a skin lesion, you go for uh, either the bone marrow, which is typically what we would do in this country. Sometimes a liver biopsy is done. Uh, what they do in Kenya and other parts of the world, they'll actually do a splenic aspiration. It turns out that there's so much white pulp in the spleen that uh, there's there's relatively lower ch risk of bleeding when they do this. They use a fairly small needle, by the way. I think it's on the order of like, you know, 26 gauge needle or so. But uh, they do get a little bit of uh, blood in the hub, and when they look at it, they'll they'll see uh, buckets of, of Leishmania. It's also another way of diagnosing malaria, though that's not how I would typically attempt to do it. But for uh, areas where uh, splenomegaly is caused by malaria, they will see abundant parasitized red cells there, which makes sense because they're often held up in the spleen anyway as part of the filtering mechanism. Well, the spleen goes from about here to here in most cases. They're huge spleens and they basically would just feel around until they, they think that's the least amount of skin over the spleen. They just go in and there's usually just a little bit of a, a saline in it. They'll, they'll kind of work it back and forth and it's, it's sometimes very hard to aspirate. I've, I've seen movies of uh, where uh, they were showing the technique. And they get a little bit in the hub, they take it out, and they tell them, well, if you get really sick after this, you probably ought to come back. Uh, the, the complication rate is on the order of about 1% to 2%. Uh, you wouldn't do that in a normal spleen, by the way, because there you really have large open sinusoids full of blood, whereas in these spleens I've seen the histology of them, and it's, it's packed with white cells and, and macrophages, and really the sinusoids are all squeezed together. Okay, so treatment, um, 
in the case of Old World and New World Leishmaniasis, with one exception, most cutaneous disease, if it's in a place where it isn't impairing aesthetics, if it isn't over uh, joint or tendons and is going to cause a functional problem, you, you can pretty much leave it alone. Um, some people are okay with that. Other people are aghast at the thought of not doing everything possible to treat it right now. Fact is, if you do treat it, it's gonna, you're still going to have an ulcer for the better part of a month before it finally heals up. Um, the one exception to New World is uh, if it's an L. brasiliensis infection, you must attempt to make the, distinguish whether this is a, a brasiliensis or some other leishmania. Uh, you do need to treat that during the cutaneous stage because you don't want them to rot off their nose. Uh, visceral leishmaniasis, uh, untreated disease, is usually fatal once it's to a progressive visceral stage, and that needs to be treated. Um, but downside to all this is most available therapies, and this is changing a little bit now, but most available therapies are toxic and fairly expensive. And so that has made uh, a treatment difficult. The gold standard, still considered a gold standard, and what the WHO would recommend people use is uh, parental antimony or pentavalent. Uh, there are a couple forms. Uh, you know, stibogluconate is, is the one that uh, we get through the CDC here. You're not going to see it in a hospital pharmacy. You pretty much have to get it from the CDC. Visceral or cutaneous. <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> the gold standard for both visceral and cutaneous. Cutaneous, you'd run about 20 days. You use a slightly bigger dose sometimes in longer course for visceral disease. Uh, Indian visceral leishmaniasis may be a little more resistant uh, uh, to stibogluconate. No one really knows why, and so they tend to treat longer there. The toxicity is you will get EKG abnormalities, but the good news is that actual reported cases of sudden cardiac death with um, uh, antimony treatment uh, are two perhaps from China and those are very poorly documented. So uh, even though most hospital administrators will, would want you to keep a, a monitoring on, uh, the, the, the chance of death is very low. There is a much higher risk though of pancreatitis and in the Walter Reed unit when they've treated with antimony and they tend to push the doses a little higher, they've, they've, they're running about a 15 to 20 percent risk of pancreatitis which is symptomatic and has elevated lipase and, and amylase and so that, that, that's something to look out for. Myalgias and arthralgias are almost universal. People are really achy with this. Not as bad as interferon alpha but it's, they're, they're not super happy. Um, Interlesional antimony has been used a lot by Iraqi and Saudi Arabian physicians, and they're, they're happy with it. Um, th there's, I'm not convinced there's been a good prospective randomized study uh, where they, they, they attempted saline instead of antimony. I think in general this tends to be more anecdotal. We did this, it got better. Problem is with all these studies with leishmaniasis is your normal cutaneous leishmaniasis is self-resolving and you can't predict when it's going to resolve. So um, you, you really need to have large numbers in a prospective fashion before you can <clears throat> make some sort of statement of significance. How does pentavalent antimony work? Uh, it's, in the last few years, it, it's become a little more apparent that it seems to interfere with a very important molecule in trypanosomes in Leishmania known as tryptothione. And this is just basically one of these, uh, because of all the uh, sulfhydro groups here, it's just a way of, of basically monitoring redox potentials, trying to keep the oxidative uh, activity under some control. And then this molecule gets recycled through um, very much like a glutathione in, in mammalian metabolism. And if you inhibit this, it's clear that energy production is, is, is disrupted and it, it seems to be uniquely toxic in Leishmania and trypanosomiasis and not other species because they just don't have this, this molecule. Um, otherwise, uh, these are the points in uh, cutaneous Leishmaniasis already made. Uh, there are some things of uncertain benefit. Uh, one is uh, ketoconazole or some of the triazoles have been tried. There are very small studies suggesting some benefit. Someone else goes back and repeats the study in the same place, presumably with the same organisms, and they get the complete opposite result. So the jury's out. This is something to do if you have a patient and they're wigged out, but they don't want to take uh, antimony. Uh, you would probably give them a triazole, which would make them feel better, but I'm not convinced it really works. It's just not really good data. Uh, and always treat uh, L. brasiliensis, okay, for the fourth time. And treatment of visceral leishmaniasis is, is a little harder. I mean, you do need to treat in all cases because you don't want them to die. <clears throat> and in India, it, you've, you've got to be careful about where they got it because you might have to treat more aggressively. There are some very useful alternatives here, and one is amphotericin, particularly liposomal amphotericin. And for kids in South 
Italy, particularly around Bari, uh, they have a fairly high uh, uh, rate of visceral leishmaniasis there on the upwards between 20, sometimes 50 cases a year. Um, they have some big case studies, and they use liposomal amphotericin, which works quite well. Yes? Not, not really. I think, well, first off, you know, the use of amphotericin B in, in Kenyon, I think, is unheard of. I, I think it's always been stabbed with gluconate because that was made available by the um, Burroughs Welcome Trust uh, free for a long time. And then it, it sort of lost its sponsor. And I think when uh, Merck got Burroughs Welcome, uh, Glaxo took over and they decided they, would, they, they seized production basically they stop the production of uh, ant antimony. Now it's almost always of Chinese or uh, Indian manufacturing. It's more available now. Uh, it's much cheaper. I don't know if it's cheaper than regular amphotericin B, but I, for the life of me, I can't recall seeing any, maybe some old reports of amphotericin B as a salvage mechanism in Indian leishmaniasis, but uh, I think in Europe Everyone just goes liposomal amphotericin B. I think in part because they're younger and they're worried about, you know, they're more sophisticated and they worry about the, the renal consequences. It works. I'm sure uh, the regular amphotericin would work as well. I just don't recall seeing much about it. Some of the newer agents include maltefacine, which uh, was <clears throat> actually discovered uh, at Walter Reed when they did some mass screening of uh, orphan drugs for activity against leishmania. The good news here is it's an oral drug. It's not terribly toxic. Uh, it is teratogenic and it causes some diarrhea, but it's not too bad. It can be taken PO and it has been quite effective in treatment of visceral leishmaniasis, um, uh, particularly in HIV negative subjects. And I think there's some studies undergoing with HIV positive subjects now. Uh, there's some cysteine proteinase inhibitors everyone was excited about, but I guess it, it's hit a um, developmental glitch and is on, on the um, is on the, the back pile for a while. Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Milhouse on, on campus over here has been involved somewhat with it, this this molecule, and um, and, and uh, a good person to talk to if you want to see if there's anything else in the pipeline. Which there are a couple things. All right, and a treatment of diffuse cutaneous and mucotinous leishmaniasis, you're not going to realistically deal with that. It's very difficult. Uh, multiple treatments with either amphotericin or um, uh, antimony don't work very well. And of course, just pointing out that uh, L. Infant infantum in uh, South Europe is a common uh, opportunistic infection of uh, AIDS, probably the commonest uh, opportunistic infection in South Europe right now. Any adult who develops uh, visceral disease who's lived in that area is highly suspect for having AIDS. And um, so th th these are all uh, signature disease uh, infections that uh, result in testing. <clears throat> and what's disturbing is that um, uh, in the case of infrequent drug abuse, um, the parasitemia associated with uh, leishmaniasis infection in AIDS is really quite high. You may have as many as 100 parasites per mil, which is almost, it's very rare to find parasitemia in your normal immunocompetent host. So there's a lot of concern about uh, needle-borne transmission. I don't think anyone's actually demonstrated that yet, though. It's just a concern. And can it happen here? Um, there is a outbreak of Leishmania and Phantom um, in foxhounds in this country. <clears throat> it's been ongoing for quite a while. It's unusual and that doesn't seem to be transmitted by sandflies. Uh, they've had to destroy a lot of foxhounds because of that. It seems to be something unique to foxhounds. Maybe they have some genetic defect. Nobody seems to know anything about it. The CDC has been studying it and uh, I can't get anyone to really tell me much about it. Um, we also know that Eldonavani complex can easily uh, can successfully emerge in a new world, and we need to look out for the possibility that eventually uh, Leishmaniasis can establish itself in the United States because we do have competent sandflies. And then finally, there's lots of imported disease, which is where these bugs would come from. Most typically, it's travelers, the military personnel, and immigrants. Uh, we do have people coming in with disease. Um, I saw one person with visceral disease, an armed serviceman who actually had been an old man 10 years. 
Oman uh, 10 years previously, and he delay, had a very delayed presentation of visceral disease. If the right side flies had been around, then Cleveland would have had an outbreak, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and there is some domestic disease. Uh, El Mexicana is endemic to areas of Texas. And dogs imported from South Europe, uh, there's, there's a uh, significant infection rate with um, leishmania that, that needs to be uh, looked out for. Okay, <clears throat> I'm just going to end off right there. Since it's about 12.30 anyway. CDC, <clears throat> CDC would say treat them with antimony. Right. That, that's still what they consider a uh, standard of care. No, you have to call the Division of Parasitology. They have a stockpile at the Atlanta airport, and they'll fly it out to you if you need it. But you have to demonstrate uh, the presence of leishmania either by a, a biopsy or smear. Um, <clears throat> there, there is toxicity to treatment of interfering gamma, uh, and uh, that, that's an experimental protocol. You'd have to have your IRB sign off on that. Uh, that that's, um, I don't think that would be the way to go at all. Uh, I think clearly metephacine has a lot of promise for cutaneous diseases as well, and it's very likely we'll see uh, that available in the future at some point. Um, it's being tested in Central America. Uh, for cutaneous disease. They run into the usual problem, which is people show up and they don't have real clear histories on how long they had the ulcer, where they got the ulcer. They don't always have good parasitology to know if a group is homogeneous or widely disparate. And so you, you pick a, a control group and you have an experimental group and they both heal at about the same rate. And it's very hard to tell if um, there, there, there's an important effect there because it is a self-healing disease and so your data tends to be biased towards people who are hurling, healing earlier in both groups uh, so it's who knows but and eventually they may have that as well Yeah, there, there's no association with uh, polymorphisms in the toll receptors. I know people have kind of screamed for that. There have been genome-wide associations. The, the bigger interest there is the difference between progressive visceral disease and self-healing visceral disease. I think for cutaneous disease, again, people tend to stay away from that because you can't really figure out you can find a skin test positive group and then a group that has no with no scars and a skin test positive group with scars suggesting they actually had disease and attempts at doing uh, genome wide scanning or you know uh, SNP analysis um, that that data has been a mess uh, in part because it it's you know there, nothing's really turning up now with visceral disease there there have been a couple associations. <clears throat> One that turns up with almost every intracellular parasite or intracellular pathogen is the vitamin D receptor locus. And no one really knows what, quite what that is all about, although there is some suggestion that uh, dihydroxy vitamin D does have some <clears throat> role in maintaining cell mediated immunity. Um, there is a molecule called NRAMP that is somehow involved in metal transport in and out of phagal isosomes. On these scans, that always seems to turn up as, as with a significant uh, score. Um, <clears throat> I think for people who have anomalies in interfering gamma production and response, uh, like Dr. Casanova has for mycobacteria, uh, th those patients are probably at greater risk of leishmaniasis, but um, I don't think they've identified any kindred with, with multiple cases of leishmaniasis. So there's, there's not anything out there that, that's like dramatic. It's, it's probably a combination of the totality of all your naturally occurring polymorphisms and subtle differences in function, sort of like autism. Right, right, right. 
and I've not, yeah, and I've not really seen it broken apart much. Uh, you know, certainly Southern Europe visceral disease is as prevalent as visceral disease in Sub-Saharan Africa as it is in India, as it is in China. Um, it, you know, as, it, assuming the same degree of exposure to biting sandflies. Right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, a couple things I think the most importantly is is yeah, they, they, they have these inflatable huts now and there's a couple of different companies that make these and you just turn on the the blower, it blows up, they they have insect screen. Uh, apparently they're very comfortable to live in and uh, you have a door you close. Um, the other thing is is uh, because there, there are little micro environments that are very enriched in sand flies um, and sometimes around that's around rocks and other things. I, I've been told occasionally you know they, they try and steer for nice smooth sand areas where they're not near rocky outcrops or a big pile of brush. Uh, probably for a couple reasons, because you know someone might be hiding there, I suppose. But um, but there's that they use deed a lot more. They they're using um, uh, long sleeves. Uh, they're using long pants all the time. So they're um, that that's probably contributed most of it. There are some cases I know, but we never see them or hear about them because they all go straight to Walter Reed. Right, Alan McGill has his own. Uh, he has a uh, a word there. And by the way, you know, I've, I've talked to him previously, and he said. If somebody who ever wants to go out there and see a lot of Leishmaniasis, probably on their own penny, you know, they're, they're, they're welcome to visit. Okay.